introduction. I gave a little bit of background on who we are and why we're here today. We will hear from our guest speaker. We'll have group discussion. Michelle's totally open to, and myself, we're open to having you chat in questions and we can answer, um, have question and answers live as we're going through this learning community because we do want it to feel like a discussion, not just you're being talked at, but we are in this together. Um, at the end, we'll have reflections. We'll talk about some updates with Strategies 2.0. We'll have our survey, um, and then we will have our evaluation and sign off. So with that, I'll turn it over to Michelle to introduce herself, and then we will have the poll following her introduction. Thank you. <laughs> there we go. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you so much for um, inviting me to participate this morning. I'm Michelle Gruppi. I am the executive director for COPE Family Center, um, which is a family resource center in Napa County. Uh, we've been around for, uh, this is our 48th year of service and our mission is to empower parents, nurture children and strengthen the community. And one of our programs, in addition to many of our direct services that we work with the families um, and caregivers in Napa County is also the Child Abuse Prevention Council. So I am um, honored to work with all of the great leaders in the 10, Bay, we're one of the 10 Bay Area counties that comprise uh, the Greater Bay Area Child Abuse Prevention Council. So in addition to doing kind of some of the advocacy work and um, uh, services that CAPSI um, provides in Napa, also able to work with a lot of wonderful people um, to look and see if we can have a greater regional impact. So that's my that's my uh, my background. <laughs> I'll, do I pass it back over to you, Janae? Yes, thank you so much for your introduction. And wow, 48 years, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, Bryn, can you help us out with our poll so we can see who else is joining us today? So our poll has been launched to see what sort of organizations you all are coming from, um, just so we can get a better feel of who is in the room. Um, we've had 82% of people vote, so I will keep it open for a little while longer. Um, but if you are unable to see the poll, uh, I apologize. Feel free to type in the chat what kind of group or what organization you're from. Or even if you do see the poll, but you want to get more specific, please be sure to tell us you know, who you are, what your role is, and where you're from. Okay, I'm going to give it five, four, three, two, and we've had 91% of people um, vote, so I'm going to close it now. So it looks like we've got an 80-20 split. 80% 80 of you are from community-based organizations or nonprofits, and 20% of you are with um, child abuse prevention or CAPSIs. Awesome, thank you, Brian, and welcome everyone. So we will jump back into our presentation. Make sure to chat in any questions. Again, we want this to be interactive and a conversation. Um, so feel free, we'll be watching and waiting for those questions. And it's over, turning it back over to you, Michelle. All right. Um, well, great, we'll get, get started. Um, so when Janae and Carol asked me to participate, <laughs> <laughs> this I said, I'm happy to share what information I've learned. I, you know, I've always been um, someone that has just fallen into and learned as I've gone along in my career. It's only within probably the last three or five years that I've uh, actually um, been a little bit more strategic about what I want to do. Um, so I actually started um, fresh out of college working as a 
um, counselor at a group home in Contra Costa County. I was barely probably five years older than some of the kids that I was taking care of. <laughs> and um, from there, I went a little bit into, I went into the administration side after doing that for four or five years and, and thinking like, this is good work, but it's hard work. And I'm, I'm kind of done with the direct service. So went into the admin and did a lot of fundraising um, and I've been at COPE for 16 years um, and started in the development um, role and then moved into an associate director um, role and um, the, have been the executive director for the past three years. Um, and so it really was when I, the, the end of my associate director um, role that I started looking a little bit more around leadership development. I had a little bit more experience around um, program development from being in in fund development and talking to people about what we were what we were doing and so I'd say you know it was about four years ago that I was introduced to the um, uh, design school at um, Stanford and they have a program um, that is six days I think it's six days six days long and it's um, designing um, for social sector service um, change. And so um, I had gone to a couple of leadership programs before that, but this one really um, focused on humans, on the use of human centered design, which basically means if you're going to look at changing a system or developing a program or adjusting a program that you have that you really want to start to look at the people that use that system or operate within that system which is the stakeholders like your clients um, the people that provide the service the partner organizations so that was really my first introduction into um, more directly engaging stakeholders in how they move through the different programs and services like before that of course you know what we've all what we all do is you know you, you send out your surveys to your clients and your partners and see you look at your needs assessments for the community um but this approach is really kind of diving a little bit deeper into um what how what the experience is of your of your stakeholder um, so with that, um, I was, I think, and in our community in Napa, we're really fortunate that I was kind of the second wave of, of people in Napa that have, that went to this D school program, um, at Stanford. And, um, there were two colleagues, um, that sat on the first five commission with me, um, that had gone the year before. And that was, you know, they came back very excited and energized. And so we, um, so I went with an, a, kind of the next cohort and we now have, I'd say about 15 people in Napa that have um, gone through that program at, at various um, public health department folks um, and other community-based organizations and a number of the commissioners of the first five. And so through that, um, what we have done as a commission um, wearing my commissioner's hat is we decided that we were investing a lot of money um, in our programs, but that wasn't making a big difference after 20 years of investing first $5. So we really wanted to look at how we were making a difference or how we could make a difference in the system, the early childhood system. So we um, started a program called the first five napa network and again it uses um the the concepts of human centered design and there's a link um on the um slide that you can kind of look at um but basically what we did was we got further training there was a cohort of i think 19 of us from sector from cross sector representation so folks from business from county and city government um community members, like small business owners, community-based organizations, and folks, a very diverse group. Um, we, we really worked to make sure that we had a diverse group of people involved, um, both in terms of kind of ethnicity, but also um, where they were in the organization um, in terms of, you know, if they're leaders at the organization or direct service. 
middle management um, so that we got a lot of different perspectives. And so we, we learned a lot more about human-centered design and also some leadership skills, but we all um, had to break up into teams and do some design work. And it was all around looking at stakeholder engagement. So um, the, the way that we did that was there were three particular projects. And if at some point you go to the first five website, you'll, you kind of can um, see some of those different projects. I was on the project um, that we were looking on and looking at how we might create ways to see, face and address inequity in Napa County. Um, but there were two other groups that looked at um, how we might create ways for parents and caregivers of young children to better access, engage in, and benefit from services that are currently available to them and with a focus on LGBTQ families. And then the other was to create ways to increase trust between law enforcement and populations with a history of trauma with law enforcement. So immigrant, migrant, migrant undocumented, or LGBTQ. Um, families. So those were three different kind of projects that were going along um, where we really were geared towards looking at what the stakeholders for those different groups were interested in. So for my particular um, project, which was around equity, inequity in the wine industry, we did a lot of interviews with different folks. Um, so we, our group of four, our team of four, um, set up meetings with uh, individuals in the wine industry, so leaders um, or uh, vineyard managers, winery owners, to kind of say, um, what different services do you provide for your employees to um, forward their career in the industry because we had no we had heard or we had an assumption that a lot of times you have immigrant families or mixed status families that work in the wine industry for years and years and never rise through the ranks to get to some of the middle management or upper management positions. So we talked with them a little bit of, about what they provide. A lot of folks provided um, a lot of really great programs that were um, around how they could improve their professional development within their particular skill set. Um, so whether they're out in the fields and they're doing the, um, the trimming um, and, and those kinds of things to um, in, in, uh, ESL classes, uh, English as second, second language, um, and different services like that. So a lot of different resources. So they felt that they were doing what they needed to do. And they also noted the challenge that a lot of times people did not take advantage of those, um, those services. So then we went and we spoke with a number of um, uh, the workers, folks that worked um, in middle management, um, folks that worked in the fields um, and from all different um, ethnic backgrounds. And what we heard was that a lot of the field workers who'd been doing it for years, years and years, and, and many who were monolingual or bilingual Spanish speaking, um, appreciated some of those services, but they weren't exactly what they needed. They needed more information on how to access services um, to support their families or parenting services. Um, or that they didn't feel comfortable because of language barriers um, between themselves and their supervisors. And they didn't see a clear path for themselves to progress in this, in this industry beyond what they were doing. Um, and that they didn't want their kids to go into that field. Um, so we, uh, we, we finished and we were gonna try and come up with some kind of, um, project or way in which we could share the information with both groups and we decided we didn't have enough information so what we did is we went the napa um, valley grape growers uh, has a big event every year called dia de la familia and we set up a booth at that particular um, event and we wanted to collect and, and the folks that go are all folks that are in working in the wine industry and so we went and we decided that we wanted to collect more information from Latinx families on what they appreciated about this event, how um, they uh, 
what what kind of trainings and services they appreciate, what they're looking for. Um, so that's what we did. And we went and we made it a fun um, event where we had funny little faces that everybody could take pictures and get Polaroids with them and their families and entertain the kids and had different activities while some of our um, colleagues could interview them and ask some key questions. Um, so it was, so what we found was people were very interested in those different learning opportunities. But again, it was, it was a lot of the same things that we heard from our families um, or the initial interviews that we had around how they really wanted different things than their um, employers were providing. So then we had the opportunity to go back to the Grape Growers Association and some of the winery owners and vineyard management folks and say, you know, we did these um, interviews and these are some of the things that we found. And there are these resources in the community that from the community based organizations that um, are already be, being provided. And I said, you know, for example, COPE is, you know, those parenting classes, we've done them out in the vineyards during lunchtime in the past. Um, you know, we can come and talk to the, the managers about what different resources available so they can make referrals. And there's a whole network of community-based organizations that are already doing these things that you, you know, you don't have to pay extra for, but you can just connect your employees with. So, um, and so that was a great way in which um, we were able to, to talk directly to um, stakeholders of ours, but also um, some of our partner organizations and say, you have good intentions here, and but this is what folks are really wanting. Um, so it was, and so now we've kind of developed a relationship with them. I mean, we had pre-COVID. <laughs> <laughs> it's shifted a little bit now, but um, to you know to really do better outreach and coordination with folks so that they um, could connect their employees with our services and that they knew that we were a resource and partner in that in that way. Um, so that's just one example again of the um, programs that we worked with around stakeholder engagement. Um, another really great one that, and, and you know, in acknowledgement of June being Pride Month was the, the other um, program that our, my colleagues worked on and um, doing um, some interviews with families around, um, again, how to better access um, how to have how to create ways for parents and caregivers of young children to access and engage in services for them and they looked at the um, lgbtq families specifically and so as a result of that um, and those interviews that they did um, a whole um, new group um, called the rainbow action ne network um, has arisen out of that group and they it's a whole new group of stakeholders and people who weren't involved in the community in this way and last year they took a lot of efforts to um, work on getting the pride flag raised at all of the cities and counties they have a play group that they're doing they're doing things with early child care providers around putting kits together and all of the information that they're gathering and the actions that they're taking are based on feedback from their stakeholders of what they want to see and how they want to go. So I, I encourage you to kind of check out a little bit more about that that project. It's really taken off, um, taken off really, really well. Um, okay, then the next um, area where we've been using um, stakeholder engagement in Napa County is our Live Healthy Napa County um, collaborative that is um, housed at Public Health, but it's a, another one of those community collaboratives where they do our community health needs assessment every um, couple of years and get, get community and stakeholder input. And they are using, um, similarly, are using some tenants of human-centered design. Um, and they were using these kind of in like at the same time in parallel as when First Five was starting to go to um, our different, um, to, to the D school and starting our First Five Napa network. Um, so the one example that I wanted to share around how we used, um, Kind of empathy interviews and um, gathering data from 
stakeholders is around a collaborative that we have to do. Um, a, it was a project around the census. So our complete count committee for Napa County um, <clears throat> used um, and specifically our hard to count target population um, committee um, was looking at the question of how might we engage um, our um, hard to count populations in participating in the census. And, you know, we had our assumptions of what that, what those things might be, but we wanted to um, see if those were correct, but also um, get information on how we create our marketing and our outreach campaign. So um, what we did was we trained um, probably about 20 or so different um, community members, um, not community members, uh, 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 providers at 20 different, 20 or so different um, community-based organizations that were going to be doing outreach in how to do empathy interviews and how to go out and meet with folks that are trusted messengers in their circles um, and ask them what are the things that would prevent you from participating in the census or why do you want to participate in the census or what do you know about the census so you know they're they're being trained on how to go out and not just ask um, standard questions but really um, ask some questions but then listen to what the responses are and um, probe a little bit more deeply into um, kind of the feelings behind those statements um, so that then a campaign could be created to really tie into what those kind of core feelings are about participating in the census. So we deployed, we trained those folks, we deployed them, we um, came back then as a group and we had um, those um, providers kind of report back what they heard. And so we focused on, again, the hard to, hard to, hard to count populations. So um, that includes, um, uh, uh, our uh, language minority um, uh, residents, so Spanish speaking and Filipino Tagalog are the two primary um, um, demographics that we interviewed. Um, LGBTQ um, families or, or residents and individuals, um, seniors, um, folks that are living in low broadband areas. I think I know there's a couple. Oh, youth. Um, so those are all tend to be the hard to count communities. So did interviews with probably around 20 different community members spread out amongst those. And then we came back and talked about what, what um, the providers learned when they had those interviews. And then based on that, we were able to um, kind of get some key themes that came out and talk about like what are the most like effective ways in which we could do our outreach and how might we um, reach out to those groups and every single one of those people that we interviewed were all very honored to be interviewed and they all stated that they wanted to be involved not just in whatever campaign we came out with but um, in any outreach and um, kind of sharing of the importance of doing the census um, as volunteers. So that was a kind of a great, another great result of that. So um, if you go to what's on the next slide, um, Janae, I'm just trying to think if I am missing anything there. Oh, yeah, there you go. So, um, so there's a link to, um, it gives a little bit of an example about the group that was is really behind that um, particular um, event and if you go to that you can see a picture of the training of the the all of the providers um, but the results that the result that came out of that is that we um, what we learned is people want to see and you know let me, let me say that. And then, the, you know, the, the, the feds and the state all have tons of marketing campaigns around um, the census and none of them are consistent. they all have slightly different messages. And so we were one of the things that we heard was people want to know, like, how do I know that this is really um, information coming from the census, that it's safe with all of the challenges we have around um, fear, fears from our immigrant 
um, community, what we heard was that they wanted to hear from people that they knew and the trusted messengers in our community. So what we did is we developed a um, video campaign and we did videos, uh, short videos with the talking points that everyone said were things that were important for them to hear and it resonated with them. And we had our trusted messengers do short, like 30 second to one minute videos. And then all of the community-based organizations are able to go onto the county website and pull those down and share them on their, on their social media. So that our community is seeing and hearing about the census and how to fill it out and why it's important from people that they uh, but that they know and their faces are familiar and that they're trusted. So that was the um, result of our stakeholder um, or of our um, human-centered design and stakeholder engagement around the complete count committee. So I've been talking a lot, and I think that's the last stakeholder engagement. Is that the last stakeholder engagement slide? Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to give an opportunity if anybody has any questions. Um, and, and again, like I said, I am, um, a lot of this I learn about as I go along, and I, I just have provided some examples of things that, that we have done, and um, I'm happy to share any of the kind of connections or um, uh, resources that we've been able to use that, that may, I may not have put in the, um, in the slides. So. Um, so if there's no questions, I'll just keep talking. <laughs> I'm gonna take a sip of coffee though while I wait and see if anybody has anything. All right. We definitely well, appreciate yeah, definitely appreciate this time with you all. And I know that we are a small but mighty group. So if any questions <laughs> you have, definitely ask away. Uh, we have some experts also in our chat are in attendance. And so we can yep. partner and have some great discussion if you all would like. Yeah, I was um, I was going to be one of, of of a number of people on a panel. I think that that maybe didn't come to fruition with everything that happened. So I, by no me, I'm one person that's <laughs> sharing my experience. But I'm happy to hear how others um, that are on uh, have been doing some of this work as well. This is just my one perspective. Um, okay, so with that, I'll just keep going then, and and we'll see what see what we what we come up with. So. Um, a lot of overlap is as Janae and I were talking um, about these two topics. I was like, there's a lot of intersections between stakeholder engagement and agency collaboration. And the only way that we were able to engage our stakeholders in the way that we have, or, or have in the examples that I provided, plus moving forward, um, we uh, it required a collaborative effort from multiple organizations. Um, so I, the thing that I have found, and we've done, COPE has been the lead agency for a lot of collaborations um, in the time that I have been um, at COPE Family Center. And um, the things that I have found um, are key elements of successful agency collaboration are shared values amongst the organizations that are working together. And I think even more importantly is trust among the partners. So really um, we're fortunate that we're a small community. Um, so that helps in terms of building relationships with one another um, and getting to know one another and understanding that um, not one organization has the capacity to meet all of the needs. So let's really work to see how we can um, each bring our strengths to a proposed project and then, um, you know, whatever assets um, we have bring to that. And for, for um, COPE as a fiscal lead is we've built a um, strong infrastructure, um, administrative in infrastructure that gives us the capacity to be that fiscal lead for organizations. And in many of our collaborative partnerships, um, you know, we, rely on our partners like we have one partner that we work with um, quite consistently who is very skilled in um, community organizing and community engagement so 
um, they bring that resource to the table where we bring kind of the fiscal um, support to the table. Um, and and that is is great in terms of both accomplishing our goals, but also um, learning. I mean, I've learned a ton from my partner agencies that bring different skill sets that then I can apply to um, our programming as we as we do different work. So those are, I think, the most important pieces of um, of collaborating with different organizations. And again, it all goes back to the relationships you have with the, the leadership of those organizations. Um, so I have a and couple more. Like, yeah. Yeah, it looks like Carol had a comment here and just mm -hmm. um, that I like that the approach was project centered. So is there anything extra you want to speak um, to before um, moving forward? Yeah, pro in being project centered around. Um, yeah, I mean, I think what makes it, you know, that is really, I think, the easiest way to kind of get involved and test the waters around agency collaboration. Um, and all of those projects, um, uh, you know, the census project and um, was actually built out of um, a short term collaborative with um, like-minded organizations. And we actually started um, right after the 2016 elections. <laughs> a lot of us came together and said that um, we wanted to come together and be able to elevate the voices of our, our, of our clients because of the um, fear of what might happen at a federal and federal level with regard to a number of our clients. And so we started with a project that um, wasn't funded, that was just, we were all passionate about, and we said, this isn't a long-term thing, we're gonna just start um, working on this one thing. And it was an immigration proclamation um, with our county supervisors and all of our um, cities. And from that, we finished that, and we said, well, that worked out pretty well, and there's still other ideas that people had. And so that actually grew into the group that started doing we, then we moved to voting and then and then moved on to census. So project base is a really great way to kind of test the waters and develop those relationships. So thanks for pointing that out, Carol. Um, so I think I had two other cases for agency collaboration. What did I put? Oh yeah, okay. So this, this one, I tried to do one that was more around um, program. Um, delivery that we do at Cope Family Center, and then one that's a larger community agency collaboration. So uh, about six or seven years ago, um, in our community, like a number of communities, there was a push towards um, looking at uh, delivering evidence-based programs for a number of funders. So as we do in the community-based <laughs> sector, um, we um, uh, pivot and you know, figure out what needs to what we need to have to be able to um, secure the funding and and also I think the integrity of the programming of, of evidence based programs when you find a program that has the research that backs it up. Um, it's important to invest in those in those services because a lot of our funding is from contributed revenue and and we're accountable to those donors and investors that um, that uh, contribute their hard-earned cash to our um, to our cause. So we um, at COPE were looking at a couple of different um, evidence-based parenting programs and came across Triple P. Um, and we realized that if we were going to do this, a lot of the um, outcomes, the positive outcomes, long-term outcomes associated with the program required the involvement of multiple partners. So we started the process of kind of meeting with the other leaders of other family resource centers and early childhood providers to talk with them about what they were looking for in terms of um, parenting curriculums. And we all came to the decision to, to work with Triple P. So we secured, um, so that was kind of the first step um, again was, is really checking in with folks and saying, we're interested in doing this. We don't want to do it in a vacuum on our own. We see the value in doing it as a community effort. Um, this is the this is the curriculum we're looking at, but we're not tied to it. So if there's any um, other options, let's 
um, uh, look into those. And so we all collectively came to the agreement to um, invest in Triple P. Um, Coke took the lead in, in um, applying for funding to um, really do some strategic planning about how to roll Triple P out. If you're familiar with Triple P, there's so many different um, levels and elements to um, rolling it out and it's 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 expensive so we wanted to do it in the best way possible so we got a three-year grant um, the first year was a strategic planning grant all of the partners participated in that process um, and then we started getting folks trained up um, in that program uh, and then we started adding more partners so we started i think with um, four partners and now we are up to 12 partner organizations um, and they're all the family resource centers um, or a number of family resource centers. We, we, that was what we realized too. We didn't all need to be doing that same service. Um, folks from Health and Human Services at Napa County, some folks from Napa County Office of Education, Napa Valley Unified School District um, and probation department. So we now have a large collaborative. They meet to talk about, um, uh, we have a, um regular meeting where they talk about what are the next services that we want to bring in based on community need we've written in to that um grant funding that we want to um that we have an evaluator that's been evaluating the program and we're now i think in our sixth year and the the um, indicator of starting to see some of those long-term outcomes is uh, getting about 20%, I think, of your um, community at a 20% saturation level of having enough providers to reach about 20% of your population. And I think we're at about 12% at this point. It's a long, slow process, but we're making progress towards that. Um, so this picture was we we uh, had our Napa County Triple P providers went up to the legislature and uh, the state up in Sacramento um, in January because January is Triple P or Positive Parenting Month or something one of those months and so they went up and got a proclamation and met all the legislators and um, so that was kind of the culmination or the recent culmination of of all the work that the um, partners have been doing. Um, and the nice thing about it is that, you know, no matter where a parent goes for the parenting classes, they're hearing the same, they're hearing the same message and the same language. So, um, so that's a direct service example. And then the last example I have is, uh, um, is our COAD, which is Community Organizations Active in Disaster. So if you, um, well, it doesn't matter where you live in California, really. There's been a increase in <laughs> disasters over the last six to seven years, right? Um, so this particular co agency collaborative came out of um, the 2014 earthquake that we had here in Napa. Um, it was... We We'd had a flood or two before that, but not anything quite as substantial that impacted um, a, a pretty substantial portion of our community. And um, all the family resource centers, including Coke, participated in um, uh, uh, doing emergency financial assistance for folks um, and linking them to resources. Uh, and then you had a lot of other um, organizations that did food distribution and all of those kinds of things you had to do after a disaster. But there was a realization from the county, Office of Emergency Services and the nonprofit sector that um, we needed to be a little bit more coordinated in our efforts. So the Napa Valley Community Foundation started working with the o Office of Emergency Services and um, started forming our COAD. And it really came together. There was a steering committee um, that was formed from a number of organizations that responded. Um, and it started coming together in about, I think the summer of 2017. And they started doing outreach to all the different community organizations to get involved and become a member and share what they were doing. And at that point, um, I remember thinking, well, this is an important collaborative. And um, I 
I don't know if I have time for this. <laughs> and then shortly thereafter, in October of 2017, um, was when the fires started in Napa and Sonoma. And thankfully, because that group was, um, was formed, there was some sort of structure in which we could um, uh, get behind. And that really um, accelerated our ability to come together um, as a community collaborative and respond to the fires and coordinate our efforts. Um, and so after, after the fires um, and we went through the recovery and um, the, or the response and then the recovery to the fires, we um, started looking at how are we gonna prepare for the next, the next disaster and really started investing. A lot of the people saw the value of, um, of the COAD um, and our membership increased. And a lot of us who were really intimately involved in the response effort um, had learned a lot and purchased and joined um, the executive committee of the COAD and really started preparing the infrastructure of the organization to be able to respond when the next disaster um, happened, which was <laughs> much sooner than we would have liked. Um, so we, uh, responded with then the next year i think we had there was another disaster and then we had the pspss this last fall the power public safety power shutoffs which because we were so organized we were able to respond quite effectively and then most recently our longest disaster <laughs> response has been the pandemic so um the the way that the COAD works in our community, we actually have a paid staff person and we're all member organizations and everybody participates in much of the same way um, that I mentioned earlier in that you all, we all bring our various um, uh, skills and expertise to different kind of committees and work together to develop what the plans are and, um, and the response efforts. I'd say this collaboration is much more challenging in that um, you are responding based on a need rather than an intentional um, selection of partners where you have that trust and shared values. I mean, you have, we have the shared values of responding to the community, um, but oftentimes you're working with a lot of organizations that um, are unfamiliar with. I've, with um, emergency response and how you how you do that in coordination with the county and the cities and law enforcement, um, and I've learned a lot over these last three years about um, about those things. And so, as we're bringing new people in, there's a lot of time and energy that needs to go into kind of the orientation and education and structure, um, which often is not possible when you are responding to a disaster. Um, and then on the plus side is you've got so many people that want to participate and respond. Um, so just kind of redirecting again to that structure, um, the, the charter, the guidelines, um, the organization um, that is in place specifically for disasters, which is very hierarchical. Um, and again, everyone's there for the benefit of the community and wanting to do good. So um, we are uh, in a much better place and much more organized now than we were back in, in March in responding to the pandemic. So two different examples of um, agency collaboration. Um, and again, a lot of overlap between that and the stakeholder engagement as you, as you design your agency collaboration, like incorporating that stakeholder feedback and engagement into how you design those programs and, um, and relationships. I think that was my last slide, right? Oh, yep. So that's all I got. <laughs> now no, that's you. amazing. <laughs> the the great thing <laughs> that's amazing. The the thing about it is stakeholder alignment or engagement and agency collaboration, like you said, there's so much overlap. But mm -hmm. ultimately what we hear is the importance of um, really getting to know and involving all of the uh, stakeholders or or constituents, rather, even if it's a, a client or a, 
or a service provider down to if it's an organization, right? It's really making sure everyone has a job, everyone's voices um, elevated and equal in the process and just taking it in and opening it up outside of our, our own selves and our own thoughts and ways of doing things. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it, it, it's great that the two are paired together and it's great to like culminate all this to, um, coming together at the end of our series, really, to look at how how um, this can really help support counties who are going into their prevention planning, yeah. right? And like mm -hmm. how important it is in prevention planning to encourage and have all of these really deeply threaded and rooted pieces of agency collaboration and stakeholder engagement. Our yeah. last um, learning community was greatest funding and so even yeah. being able to talk about how funds come together and and the the one thing that's uh, the real threads throughout all of it is engagement right and like mm -hmm. making sure you're talking to everyone who's involved and everyone has a say and a, a part of the table and agreements are in in place and so I think that this is a lovely way to like kind of bring it all together being that this mm -hmm. is our last learning community um, and I and I do feel like, you know, you did a, a wonderful job of giving us all these different examples and such real in real time. Right. So mm -hmm. looking at the uh, disaster planning and, yeah. <laughs> and the whole coalition, I mean, if we're not in the middle of a disaster, then what is really happening right now? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I would just like to open it up again to our attendees to see if you have any thoughts um, or any um, comments that we'd like to come together with before we move into some of our um, updates of strategy. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. I'd love to hear from folks too, if you have examples. I think um, I, uh, we, Napa County is involved with uh, developing our prevention plan. So we're going into our second year um, of our Child Abuse Prevention Council. We had a, a plan last year, which was a lot of um, really more planning. And so this year we just had our meeting in June, earlier this month, um, to look at what our plans are. Um, uh, for the next, we're just doing six months. <laughs> Anything beyond that feels like too much. <laughs> um, but I'd love to hear how other people too are are approaching their prevention planning. If your if your county is involved in that, or other um, other examples that you have of agency collaboration and stakeholder engagement. Yeah, um, that's we, great, Michelle. Yeah, we have a hand raised from Carol. If um, she has anything she'd like to share. Um, I've unmuted you on my end. If the hand raise was a mistake, feel free to just type it in because I think it's been up for a little while. But if it, if you have a comment, we'd love to hear it. I'm Michelle and Janae, it's Carol. Hi. So I was typing out my comments, but I'm just going to tell you them anyway. So, <laughs> no, I think that this is really great. It does tie into the braided funding um, discussion that we had last month. And so, you know, I appreciate that. I know that um, in our county, Contra Costa, we are just in, just starting our second year as well um, of our prevention planning. Mm -hmm. And, um, we're hoping that we can take the um, braided funding presentation that we had last month and possibly even this this presentation and um, use it in our prevention planning processes. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's it's information that's helpful to us as we're still kind of we started late in the process in Contra Costa. So we're not as far along as as Napa mm -hmm. is, but we have a really committed group of um, agencies that um, are want to see this through and want to work um, mm -hmm. together. Um, so we're just sort of at that basic level of, of bringing agencies, like-minded agencies 
to the table mm -hmm. um, and we want to expand that we definitely want to bring businesses and and other stakeholders um, to the table and that I think will come later so um, yeah I just want to say thank you I think this is really great and I will be bringing all this information to our team um, and we too are sort of you know it's been really difficult with the zoom meetings and you know just mm -hmm. But people are committed to continue to work on our prevention planning process and um, it's good information for us to share. So mm -hmm. yeah, great job, thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, that is just, it's great to hear that, um, you know, counties are moving forward and I love that Michelle having a six month plan. I think that that mm -hmm. totally makes sense for the times that we are in. Um, and it just, it sounds, it sounds like, like uh, Carol was saying, counties are very much committed to their prevention planning process and really um, making those, um, or being flexible, right? Being flexible in what it could look like within the next six months. And, and I think it, it's very thoughtful and being mindful of your, who you're collaborating with, right? So there's mm -hmm. so many organizations during this time who are still figuring out how to um, be of service and how to support yeah. folks during you know this time so it's nice to have that flexibility to be meeting virtually but also to be saying that shorter timelines make sense right now because we don't know yeah. what's in the next six months maybe we can all be together again maybe we can't you know <laughs> uh, we cross our fingers of course we would love mm -hmm. those times now those uh, meetings where we were driving around so many different times a lot of us I know do a lot of traveling to uh, meet the needs of our um, the people that we serve and so i remember those days and thinking oh you know on the road again and now looking back to say i can't wait to be able to be in person and and share uh some time together in person so definitely yeah. all right anyone anyone else anything else we also have a hand raised from rebecca so rebecca i've unmuted you if you'd like to unmute yourself to share Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. yes. yes, hi. Yes, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I'm down in Florida and um, I, yeah, we're, I'm tasked, one of my tasks is to do our CHA and our CHIP, our community health assessment. And ah. I'm currently in the process of uh, creating our community health improvement plan and our entire plan is ACEs. So yeah. I decided to move forward with just ACEs and um, and that's going to be a five-year chip from 21 to 26. Um, the thing, and I may be off and just let me know that's fine. What I found really difficult when it comes to agency collaboration, and I don't know if you guys have any advice on this, it's really, I don't know if it's because we're a smaller county, um, but we I feel like we do have a, a nice robust amount of organizations, agencies here. It's really difficult to help them see the value or the necessity yeah to make them want to even participate and understand that this goes beyond just I don't know like it's deeper like it, it's a it's really tough to promote that without coming off as constantly nagging almost like yeah. well this is important please participate um and for me that's been the biggest thing how do we it seems like there there seem to be organizations that things get done because people already know each other. So they have a track record, they have credibility. Yeah. Um, but when you're trying to um, promote something like this, and we started at the grass, grassroots level in the sense that our first two years of our chip were just strictly education. Um, the, the way the chip was structured with the lady who was here before me, she structured it in a way that promoted educating, educating, educating any businesses yeah. and agencies to just let them know what ACEs are, um everything like that but for a five-year chip plan you know i want to take it to the next level i'm like we need much more involvement we need much more commitment yeah. from each of the agencies our doh can't do everything do you have any advice on building um mm -hmm. your agency collaboration um stakeholders especially to have them engaged more like in a in in for what we need strictly just for aces and how to move forward with that i don't know if that makes sense <laughs> yeah rebecca are you are you within the uh, county government i am yeah i work at the florida department of health 
Okay. Yeah. yeah. That, uh, ours is, um, well, and it's interesting because that's our, our um, Live Healthy Napa County is our um, public health effort around doing the chip and the cha. And um, so ch you could check out their, their sites, but I think that's a, a very similar prob problem that we have. And especially in Napa, I, somebody coined the term, at, went to a meeting where there was a, a funder who wanted to do a new initiative and he and, and they were um, talking about how, you know, we have to get the group together. We have to do more needs assessments and more data gathering and everyone in the room, just like their head went back because they're like, we already do that. There's so much of that. And that um, he coined the term, the one person from our county, we have that Napa has multiple initiative fatigue. <laughs> There's just right, right. <laughs> initiatives and we're all, it's the same 10 to 12 people and organizations at, um, at every meeting and um and and so we started to look at how we might align our initiatives where there's common um indicators that we're looking at and so that was a process actually that um the our capsi was leading so i think so i think that acknowledgement that everybody feels like there's so many things going on and that's one of the things that we found has been hardest um when doing agency collaborations um, so one of the ways that we have found um, to do that, and it's not an easy fix, is we provide um, stipends to partner agencies who are doing the work. So, um, and specifically what we try and do, we, we haven't been able to do this so much with our um, chip and chaw because of the way that it works, but for example, our census work or our um, our uh, voter engagement and outreach work is there's funding for, you know, from different entities. And so when we secure the funding, we put a line in for stipends for all of the organizations so that we can pay them to come to the meetings and we can pay their staff to do the outreach. And they will be anywhere from, you know, depending on the funding, 2,500 to, to $10,000. And, you know, those two particular projects have um, anywhere from 10 to 15 different agencies. Um, so it's an investment, but it's also, it's important to invest in those people's, if you want people's participation, you have to invest in those, um, in those entities. Um, and we've also done um, kind of incentives or stipends as we try and do community engagement. So again, with all these initiatives, community members are constantly asked to do surveys and come to focus groups and um, and and then there's not a feedback loop for them to see like they give you information and advice and then they and then you go away and they're like well what did you do with that like why and so there's burnout there so acknowledgement of their time of whether it's a you know twenty dollar gift card to a local market or Target or whatever. Um, uh, and being thoughtful in trying to consolidate those requests and asks um, with the different entities has been successful. But it takes it takes a lot of effort to be able to get to that because you you've got to find that find that funding um, that's available. Um, so I would say if there's a way to do your so our let's see our chip has three or four priorities. Um, one of which the primary priority um, is respect and social inclusion, which then spreads across the other was, uh, there's food access, housing, instability, and livable communities. Those are the four health priorities. Um, and respect and social inclusion was really highlighted as the top priority because those kind of are as a common thread through all of those other three. And so what we were able to do in partnership with public health, um, it, if you break it down perhaps into projects. So for example, for respect and social inclusion, we found a, a grant that um, one of the community-based organizations applied for that could then provide stipends to community members and partner agencies um, to participate in moving the development of that particular health need forward um so that might be a way for you to like break down um again thinking about those partners that you work with in your community that have that ability to um 
and that you have a relationship with that can secure that funding so that then they can kind of take the lead and some of the ownership and move those forwards and then pay people for their participation in the development of that plan. So just an idea. No, that's excellent. Thank you so much. I didn't think mm -hmm. of it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much for your awesome questions. Um, I believe the our strategies director, Michael, would like to say a few words. Michael, would you like to do that now? Um, I know you have sort of an announcement. Hi. Uh, so thanks so much, Michelle and Janae. Uh, it, just, I think it is a great cap to not just the Bay Area series, but just all of our thinking around county prevention planning and really engaging the community. Uh, strategies is going to be uh, actually as of July 1st, we become Strategies TA and we'll be very focused on these county collaborative plans. And this awesome. is a lot, a lot to chew on, a lot of tools that we want to make sure are in our toolkit. Uh, so I want to thank you both for today but Janae also for your work as a learning community facilitator you jumped in and really uh, made a, a very clear series and a very productive series for the Bay Area this year I appreciate that and I also want to express my appreciation to Carol and the Contra Costa Capsi because you've been an amazing partner for four years uh, and we'll just partner in different ways uh, and then the last thing I wanted to do is let you know, as we become Strategies TA, we are building our team. Uh, we have a couple folks who are senior technical assistant specialists uh, with an overall, uh, although there's some variation, fo geographic focus, and we are seeking a full-time senior technical assistant specialist for, um, who will mostly work in the Bay Area. So I really want to get out the word out to this group. If you know of anyone, you can go uh, actually to our parent organization, thecapcenter.org, uh, for the job announcement, uh, or you can email me at mwilliams at thecapcenter.org, and I'd love to share information. And, uh, and if you know of anyone, please spread the word. Well, thank you again. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for those great, um, for those kind words and for the information on looking and seeking um, a TA specialist in the Bay Area. So that's exciting for Strategies TA. Um, I just want to, again, take this time to thank Michelle. You've been amazing. Thank you for totally being open to having this discussion and question and answer style, which sometimes could be a little nervous, right, presenting, but at the same time, you just said yes, and you've had the great, the greatest uh, mood and spirit for that. So thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to again leave any final words. Feel free to chat in anything anyone would like to. We do have a evaluation that will pop up at the on the screen um, at the end of our presentation. And again, stay in touch with Strategies 2.0. Check out the website. Check out the YouTube channel and looking forward to hearing about all the great things you all are doing in the Bay Area community and helping for prevention planning and really involving all of your stakeholders and having that agency collaboration that we all know is so important for us to move forward better together. So thank you again. And um, that concludes our learning community. Um, and we and have again. 45 minutes of magic time that we can use however we want. <laughs> Does not Thank happen you. often these days. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> all right well thank you all again i appreciate it and i put my email in the chat box if you guys have any questions about the tools or different resources that we've used i just i shared broad ones but i'm happy to share anything with with you all that's how that's how i learn all right all right Bye. Bye. <laughs> thank you all thank you you're welcome
Thank you, Bryn. Thanks, Janae. All right, you have a great rest of your day. You too, thank you. You're welcome, bye.